Welcome to Vitality Made Simple, the podcast that empowers you to live better, look better, feel better, and to more fully enjoy the relationships in your life. You know, it's all about relationships. And that's one reason I'm so happy to have Martha Carlin with us today, because I want you first to hear her love story and how that uh, really took her not just to the high dive, but to a very high cliff diving into microbiology. Uh, she is curious, she is tireless, and um, she's fearless. She's absolutely fearless. And I so admire that. Um, you're going to be so inspired by her story. Uh, she She's made lots of discoveries, but she also has pending questions. She's not finished asking questions. She's asking very, very difficult questions. And, um, and all of this was motivated by love and the, the ultimate, you know, relationship here on earth, of course, is marriage. So, you know, she's just beyond impressive. She's a citizen scientist and the founder of, uh, and CEO of BioQuest, which I'll tell you more about my personal experience in that area. Uh, she was relentless in her pursuit to unravel some very complex health problems for her husband. And um, as a result, she has uh, been a leader in the microbiome community. So Martha, welcome and tell us your story. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, yes, I, you know, I actually started out um, my business career. Um, I had a degree in accounting and I, I went to work for Arthur Anderson as an auditor. Um, and uh, you know, that, that has informed a lot of my thinking, but, um, I married my husband, John in 1995 and in 2002, um, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at the age of 44. And I was just, I could not believe how someone as, um, young and seemingly healthy never did anything bad in his life, um, could have an old person's disease. And so when that happened, you know, I'm one of these people, I'm a partly from that training at Arthur Anderson, you know, as an auditor, you never take anything at face value. You are trained to question everything, to um, examine the evidence yourself. And I looked at how science and medicine was approaching Parkinson's and you know, it's just kind of a point solution. Like here's a drug, you're not going to get any better. Um, this is your course, you know, maybe you got 20 years and, you know, adios or, I mean, they don't, they're not quite that blunt, but it's pretty close. It's pretty blunt. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty, um, it's, it's shocking. And, um, you know, we walked out of the doctor's office and I just like sat down and started researching and, you know, that was sort of early days of the internet. Um, I started buying books and just studying the science behind things and throwing out the food in our closet and trying to, well, the pantry, not the closet. Although actually there were some sweets hiding in the closet. <laughs> too. Um, but, um, you know, that set me on this journey of teaching myself science. It had, I hadn't had a science class since my fr freshman year in college. And, um, you know, just my passion to solve the problem for John just drove me deeper and deeper and deeper into the science, really starting with the food and nutrition and diet, because I had been trained in this method called transaction flow review is how you look at a business. You follow all the transactions that flow through the business and who touches them and what they're doing and you examine you know, did it work right? And you're kind of taking notes, looking for the break points in the system, which is where that business risk is. And so I looked at the human, and I was like, well, what's, what's the main thing flowing through the system? What's the food and the water and things that we're, you know, putting in our digestive tract. And that was, you know, not long before I ever heard the term microbiome, but as I began to get more and more um, knowledge in you know, these different parts of the science and how food can affect our genes and then studying our genes. Uh, long about 2014, I read this book called Missing Microbes by Dr. Martin Blazer. Of, it is uh, on my shelf. Can you see it? Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. I mean, that was Lush. just a, a game changer for me because I also 
knew from John and anytime I met somebody with Parkinson's, I would, I was interviewing them and asking them questions and sort of making mental notes of their life history. And I knew there was, um, a history of antibiotic, like strep throat or infections mm-hmm. where they were taking antibiotics. So I, I read that book and I was like, this is just a game changer for me because he was explaining, you know, the, the human microbiome, which is the trillions of bacteria, fungi, and viruses that live in and on us. And they, they are our internal pharmacy. They're making, you know, hormones, neurotransmitters, Mm -hmm. vitamins. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have the right microbiome to make all of those things, those functions aren't working properly for us. And so then about six months after that, um, the first paper was published that showed, so in Parkinson's, there's two primary types. Um, Most people are probably familiar with the tremor that people have with Parkinson's where they shake. Um, But there's another uh, primary presentation of Parkinson's that's more postural where they they have sort of a penguin posture and a frozen gait where they their feet Mm -hmm. stick. And um, they were able to divide those two primary types by the gut bacteria. And I was like, that's it. I quit what I was doing. I I had a very lucrative job in New York City. (laughs) I quit doing that and started funding research at the University of Chicago, looking at the microbiome and starting to learn about bacteria and fungi and viruses and genetic sequencing of these organisms and, um, you know, microbiology. And so that set me on this eight year journey. Six months after that, I founded a company called the Bio Collective where we were collecting um, fecal samples from across the population, but we had a special interest in Parkinson's. We were sequencing those samples and getting that data and looking at across diseases, what's going on at a metabolic level in the gut and starting to think about things in unusual ways from, you know, how everyone else sort of looks at a single disease. My co-founder, is a virologist who had worked for 17 years at the CDC on chronic fatigue, another complex disease. And then I had a third co-founder who's no longer involved with us, but who was a scientist at the University of Chicago, who's now at the University of San Diego. He had to step back because of conflicts of interest, but he was interested in autism and we could see these microbiome patterns across diseases. So you know, I just was thinking, okay, we're, we're thinking about things all wrong. We've got to fix the metabolism. You know, you've got to go down to the systems level and start to understand like what's, what's missing. And like, I, I often use the analogy of your gut is like a factory. And if all the workers don't come in, mm-hmm. you know, if you don't have all the workers in your factory, you're probably not going to get a car out the other end. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that was kind of a long, long story, but, um, no, that's a fantastic story. And I think as our listeners get to know you, Martha, they'll realize how you're able to synthesize this information. And I actually didn't realize you'd been an auditor. That is incredible how God got you ready for Martha's quest. Uh, she has just a wonderful, um, website, Martha's quest, as well as the biota, um, quest, a website. But this information, although it started with Parkinson's disease and other, say, neurological problems, is pertinent to every single listener out there. Um, We all know, we all experience things. We all know somebody who's experiencing these problems, whether it be Parkinson's disease, um, memory loss, autism. I mean, we're we're all affected because of our environment. And uh, whenever I was thinking about interviewing you, Martha, I I felt like I was in a giant room of encyclopedias. I mean, literally I thought I I saw Martha on every, every single book because it's like, where do I start? She's, she's just such a wealth of information. I mean, you are, you're so incredible. You're able to connect the dots. Um, and that's very, very rare. And I really respect that. And so in, in, for our listeners today, um, let's talk about what I'd love to know what you've learned in terms of 
of long COVID because your husband, John did experience some of those problems. And, um, and I'm seeing a lot of that in my clinical practice. So tell me what your deep dive, uh, into the microbiome can teach us. Sure. So, well, one of the kind of big ahas in the connection of the microbiome and, um, outcomes in COVID. Um, there's actually a gastroenterologist that I'm friends with out in California, Dr. Sabine Hazen, mm -hmm. um, who has done a significant amount of research in the microbiome and specifically with COVID patients. Um, and one of the things that she found was um, the people that had more difficult outcomes with COVID had very low bifidobacteria. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, in, you know, particularly interesting to me also because in our Parkinson's cohort, um, they also had low bifidobacteria. They, they do have one strain of bifidobacteria more prevalent and it's one called bifido adolescentis, but that, um, that particular, so most bifid, bifidobacteria, and I don't want to get too technical here, they make something called plasmalogens, which have a lot of functions in the body, but this one um, bifido animalis does not make those. And it is the only bifidobacteria that is um, actually resistant to glyphosate. So the, you know, the glyphosate residues in the food supply uh, have an impact on our gut microbiome, obviously, because they are antibiotic in nature and they are particularly selective against bifidobacteria. Um, so that was interesting because I knew that John already had low bifidobacteria from, you know, in his, the data in his Parkinson's cohort. We both got COVID at the same time and his was much, much worse. I mean, we had a hard time keeping him out of the hospital um, they put them on a steroid uh, at one point and it was, I didn't know that steroids can cause insulin resistance yes. and his blood sugar was just going crazy. Yep. And so then they, they said, no, 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 you have to like no carb, low carb. Um, so, you know, we addressed that, but then after he came out of COVID, he had orthostatic blood pressure issues. He, he had, um, and some of those are associated with Parkinson's, but everything was much worse and the insulin regulation was not as good. And of course we'd done all this work prior to getting COVID to have him in great shape. Um, his, there's something called a UPDR score that you measure, you know, how advanced your Parkinson's was. And, you know, he had been a 35 in uh, 2017, we were able to bring that down to a 20 and stabilize that at a 20 for four years. And then after COVID, you know, it just really knocked him down. So we were focused aggressively on getting his gut back in shape and getting him, um, you know, turned back around. Uh, he did uh, the uh, Dr. Walter Longo's uh, yes, yes. Prolon fast mimicking yes. diet. He did mm -hmm. that about every five weeks mm -hmm. for about six months um, to get in better shape and yeah. prepared because our daughter was getting married over the summer and he needed to be in good shape for the wedding. Um, and that, you know, that was a, another sort of remarkable aha for me seeing um, when he did the fast mimicking diet on the fifth day. So you're doing lower and lower and lower cal calories. You're kicking off something called autophagy. That's cleaning up the trash in your body, which is a problem in Parkinson's. And on that fifth day, he was always much, much better. So that was really interesting to me. Then I had um, a customer. So I make a pro I make some probiotics and I originally uh, made the first formula for my husband, John, based on some research that showed that the sugar alcohol mannitol could stop the aggregation of the proteins that are a hallmark in Parkinson's in an animal model and actually pull them out of the brain and clear them out of the brain. So I came up with this concept uh, with one of my advisors, Steve, Steve Cosme, on a working system that could convert glucose and fructose from your diet into mannitol that could then 
maybe help take out this trash. So, and John had been taking that, that was part of his whole restoration pro process of improving his UPDR score and everything. So I had a customer call me and say, uh, so there's a, there's a group of people who uh, follow Dr. William Davis, who's the wheat belly yes. uh, doctor. He has a new book, fantastic book called super gut where he talks about SIBO. And so he's got some different programs where people are following his SIBO program and that they make a yogurt uh, yes. with these three strains of bacteria that produce something called a bacteriocin that can target the bacteria that you want to knock out. So I guess it's like they're more targeted than an antibiotic because they have something specific that just takes out the ones you want to take out. And so he had people, you know, making his SIBO yogurt, but people have started to make, um, a yogurt with my sugar shift formula. Uh -huh. And I got contacted by one of my customers who had a neighbor who had severe long COVID symptoms that were what she described as almost like Parkinson's. He he was mm, at a freezing wow. gait. He couldn't hold a, a spoon to eat. And she said, well, I know Martha made that probiotic for her husband. I'm going to, I'm going to make Dr. Davis's yogurt with, um, the sugar shift and she made the yogurt with the sugar shift and she did she started with about 10 capsules and the the bacteria will double about every 12 hours so 10 capsules you're they're about 20 billion each so that would be you'd be starting with 200 billion and doubling they make it over 36, 36 hours, hours. So, yes so yeah. you're going to have a hundred Trillion, gobs and gobs and gobs. Of gobs and gobs mm -hmm. and so she was making this high fat yogurt with that for him and she wrote me back after a month and she said you know he is so much better you should try this for your husband so I started making yogurt for John and so you know we make the yogurt every week and that's oh. part of our, our kind of focus oh can I interject my own personal experience there Martha um I, I follow Dr. Davis and for my listeners you know he's been on the podcast and his book, Super Guts, incredible. So I made this dorky video on how to um, make his Super Gut yogurt. Thought I was making it for, you know, my my patient family, fit, fit, you know, 50 or 100 people. And and it's, it, you know, it's, I've gotten a lot, gotten a lot of, lot of um, watches on that and people writing to me. So uh, we make that yogurt, but consequently we made your Sugar Shift yogurt. And it is so delicious of the yogurts I make. It's the most delicious. It's like whipping cream. It is like whipping cream. And so we eat it every night and it's delicious. I mean, I'm like licking the spoon, you know, and trying to get all of it, but, um, it has, um, lowered my fasting blood sugar somewhere between five, five points, 10 points, somewhere in there. Um, when I eat it now, for our listeners, you know, that we're really interested in, um, insulin resistance because that's the basis and, and, and Martha's going to talk more about that. I'll, I'll, I suspect. So, um, for all you yogurt makers out there, cause I know there's tons and in Oklahoma city, I call it our culture culture, uh, because we're, we're all making this yogurt of all different types and it's really helping people. Um, but I want to go back to glyphosate, uh, and it's, it's everywhere. Uh, the patients I see that are suffering from Parkinson's often are farmers live near wheat fields where, where, um, glyphosate's used or often another common denominator is they've been golfers. So they've been close to places, you know, where heavy herbicides, I guess it's actually a, er, an herbicide, uh, pesticides. Was there, in addition to the antibiotics that John took, was, were, was there, a lot of that uh, exposure, Martha? So there was actually um, early on in, in high school, John worked on a golf course as a caddy for four years. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just the glyphosate, they're organophile. So, you know, you often get the argument, well, they weren't used until the 1990s, but organophosphates have actually been right. used for a long time and they go back to what's sort of crazy about it is um 
organophosphates are um, were the basis of uh, the nerve gases in uh, World War One and World War Two, and then they looked for other uses, and so they, you know, they've had uh, uses that I would say are if you just kind of use logic you're going to say well it's probably not very smart to no. put that on our our food like you don't need some double blind placebo controlled <laughs> right. clinical trial to know right. that that's that that's not smart and you don't have to be from Oklahoma to know that's not a good idea <laughs> yeah but you know it's interesting too I was talking to because we're going to see uh Dr. Ben Edwards in Lubbock Texas in March, and I was talking to a friend of mine who uh, developed the root cause protocol, and he he was like, "Well, it's good you're not you're you're going in March and not April." And I said, "Why?" He said, "Well, that that's when everybody gets sick because they spray uh, the fields for the cotton, so they you know they start spraying everywhere." And he said, "And I I said, well, what about the students at Texas Tech?" He said, "Oh, the university doesn't say anything." I mean, it's not funny. I'm not, it's mm -hmm. not funny because, um, you know, people who live in these areas have no control over what's right. being sprayed around them. And, you know, these are, these are, they're nerve agents. Mm -hmm. um, and the mechanism, you know, that they, they, you know, they have an antibiotic, uh, they're even patented as an antibiotic. Glyphosate is patented mm -hmm. as an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And, um, they, they select for and kill some of the most beneficial bacteria and some of the ones like, uh, I think, uh, mycobacteria are not susceptible to it. So you're, you know, that's just part of that whole process of selecting the, the wrong kind of microbiome that then ultimately is going to, you know, shift over to bacteria that are pro-inflammatory you know, causing all these other downstream effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's ubiquitous around here. It's, it's just crazy. I'll see someone standing out in the yard. We live sort of out in the country, you know, on an acreage and I'll see people just spraying it everywhere. Yep. Squirt, squirt, squirt. It feels, I used to do it before, you know, well, John did too, you know, John did too, before we really, uh, you know, understood the implications and the, and there, there are also a lot of um, herbicides and pesticides that are used in general in our food supply. So one of the, I wrote a blog about this on Martha's Quest. There is a place in California called in the Central Valley of California that is called Parkinson's Alley. And the Central Valley of California is where about 50% of the produce in the U.S. is um, grown. And there's a researcher at uh, UCLA, Beata Ritz, who has done extensive research on with all of the data California has on, you know, pesticide residues and connections to neurological disease and Parkinson's. And, um, you know, they she had done 20 years of research and was getting so close. And all of a sudden they pulled all of her research funds. She had big R01 grants. And, you know, it's like you get, you start getting like too close to um, exposing the truth. Yeah. And you're, it's funny how your money dries up. Well, and that's why it's just so wonderful for people like you to take time to talk to um, our listeners, to me and our listeners, because it has to be individual people learning and taking responsibility uh, for their own health. Um, I think it's just so empowering. You know, uh, my listeners know that in my world, I got diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, sort of accidentally have um, zero blood markers. The oncologist said, I don't want to see you till you're sick. And, you know, so you get sort of this hopeless, um, response. I did not feel hopeless, not, not one bit, uh, at all, because I, I totally believe I've been prepared for this from, because of this free education. But one of the things that, uh, CLL does as do many kinds of cancer, uh, is that early it causes insulin resistance. And so, um, 
you know, insulin resistance is just so common. I jokingly say it's normal in our world, like, you know, constipation, irritation, frustration, and all those things we don't want, but it's, um, uh, I think that's what, that's how I found you, Martha is, is just looking for more strategies to deal with insulin resistance. And, um, so I think that's, I really thank you for giving our listeners hope. That's that's a huge part of our audience uh, who are interested in uh, keeping their blood sh- blood sugar healthy. So so I wanted I want you to really like dial down and explain mannitol more and more about mannitol because I I want to tell everybody more about um, how that can help them at the end. Well, I mean it was really interesting to me, when I came back from that conference, I bought this little book on mannitol chemistry, you know, it wasn't a quarter inch thick, but it had, I think about eight, eight or nine different studies in it about all the different things that mannitol does. So the, you know, the first chapter was about bacteria that use and produce it. There's a very limited number of bacteria that actually prefer or you know, have the genetics to use mannitol as their carbon source. Most bacteria prefer glucose or soup, you know, fructose, some other carbon source. Um, So, you know, I looked at that and said, okay, well, um, and, you know, one of those actually happens to be l ruteri, which is the strain that Dr. Davis loves so much. Um, And then, Another one was leuconostoc mesenteroides, which we have in uh, a number of our formulas in the sugar shift formula. It is a strain of bacteria that is widely found across the globe in um, native fermented foods all across the globe. Um, And um, anyway, the... In going through the book, I started looking. So mannitol and boron, the mineral boron, is the circuit prime for the heart-lung machine. So it's doing something Mm -hmm. in terms of an electrical carrier. Um, It's been evaluated as a thermal energy storage mechanism for holding energy. Um, so, you know, I started thinking about that. Then, uh, mannitol is used in the media in scientific laboratories. When people are studying, uh, the mitochondria, they will often store their mitochondria in mannitol, keeps them really happy longer. So like all these little odd pieces about mannitol, you know, just kind of kept, kept, kept coming up and, you know, there's a lot of controversy over the polyol pathway in the body. Um, but mannitol seems to have um, a different mechanism than some of the other polyols, and it's a very powerful free radical scavenger. Well, I was going to ask you if I'm correct, like in the back of my mind, I'm almost thinking it's been used for people with kidney, kidney failure. Is that correct? To it clear is- toxins and drugs? It, it, yep. It's used for that. It's used in brain trauma to pull fluid out of the brain. Mm-hmm. And then I, I actually had somebody who saw one of our ads on Instagram and, it, you know, was talking about the mannitol production. And he said, well, that's really interesting. I got um, like poisoned by uh, Cooper Jack fish in the Caribbean. And he said, I went to see the village doctor and he said, well, you know, it could take you a year or longer for those toxins to leave your body. He said, or I can give you, um, saline and a couple of boluses of mannitol and, and it, you know, probably get rid of it. And he said, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take it. And, it, yeah. and it cleared him up. So, I mean, there's a whole chapter in that little book I have of all the different uses. It opens the blood brain barrier so they use it for medication delivery improving different medications and stuff and it's it's the most abundant sugar in nature Mm -hmm. and um it's very it's more abundant in plants that are under osmotic stress so it helps manage the flow of fluid in and out of the cells in the plant so the consortium of bacteria that you have in sugar shift, 
um, correct me if I'm wrong, because I could be, uh, it helps turn, you know, glucose and fructose into mannitol so that those sugars don't raise uh, blood insulin. Is Well, so, I mean, it was originally designed just to make the mannitol, but as a side benefit, you get rid of those sugars and it stabilizes your, your blood sugar. So, um, you know, we, we, so my chief scientific officer, uh, was originally from Cuba and developed a relationship with a hospital in Cuba. And we were able to do a clinical trial there, um, last year. And, um, there, they don't use it as much here in the United States, but there's a measure called the HOMA IR that uh, mm -hmm. measures insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Cause often here in the States, uh, they don't measure your insulin level. Right. No, no. Which is, you know, kind I'm going to wait till you're sick. <laughs> um, so, uh, but this, it, um, HOMA IR measures insulin, uh, resistance. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was one of the uh, measures that really meant we only did a 90 day trial and the HOMA IR improved significantly. And we had a reduction in something called serum LPS, which mm -hmm. is an inflammatory marker that comes from gram negative bacteria. Wow. Wow. And, um, we're going to do another trial later this year in a pre-diabetes population for a longer period of time. Cause it, in 90 days, you don't really have enough time to get a, a good change in the HbA1c but yeah you see the A1c change yeah but we did uh unblind um at the end of the study and had 10 people stay on the product for another 90 days and they did have a, a, a reduction in HbA1c so that's why we're going to do this bigger study with um a pre-diabetic um so that we can actually use the data because you can't use data for a supplement um if you did any of your research in a, in a unhealthy population. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, and that's what's so important about, uh, post post COVID long COVID it's because so many people have developed insulin, um, insulin resistance as a result of the COVID virus. I mean, from what I'm seeing, I read a good study in nature from November of 21 and they went through a huge population and saw people who were metabolically healthy got COVID and then developed prediabetes. So, I mean, gee whiz, uh, to be able to uh, chase that with a, a food basically is what is what a pro, a good probiotic is. It's putting back what was designed into us so that we can get our metabolism healthy again. Yeah. So one of the other long COVID symptoms that, um, is, uh, I think I said, you know, John had this postural orthostatic tachycardia POTS is what they call it, but it's, you know, it's basically a drop in your blood pressure. So somehow it's also dysregulating the autonomic nervous system and, um, you know, impacting the, the blood pressure. And, um, I actually, the, the fellow who helped me design the sugar shift um, uh, has a daughter with with POTS and because of what they were seeing with, um, you know, more people with long COVID having this, um, he started mm -hmm. working on a combination because what they've shown for, for that is that electrolytes and probiotics are two things that can really help with that. And so we actually started working together on a formula that he came up with um, that we should have in about 60 days called Revive and Thrive that is a, a combination electrolyte and probiotic drink mix. So Martha, that's thrilling. In my clinical practice, I mean, I need to add POTS to my list because so many people now have it who didn't before. I know. And these are like things I, I so young people, as an auditor, I'm just like, I'm looking, I'm going, okay, like, where's this coming from? Because, you know, I know 30 years ago, I never heard of any of this stuff. I right. mean, you know, I never heard of anybody with pancreatic cancer. I never, right. I mean, you know, these were like rare things. And now like all you hear are these very strange things. There's actually just a, 
touch on the glyphosate again for a moment. There is a researcher, his name is Andre Liu, L-E-U, um, and I'll send you a copy of it, Debbie, because he went through and showed the the rise in about 20 different chronic diseases and the rise in the use of, uh, of glyphosate and mm -hmm. GMO corn and soy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while people will say, well, correlation is not causation. When you have 20 different diseases with the kind of P values that are in this data, you know, it's virtually impossible for that to be a coincidence in every one of those cases. And, you know, we get sort of gaslit if, if you try to talk about it right. um, as being an issue. But I mean, come on, just basic logic. You're, it's an antibiotic. It's a nerve, you know, it's based in mm -hmm. a nerve. It's, um, it was also used as a metals chelator. So we need trace minerals in our body. It's affecting mm -hmm. the trace minerals in the plants. It's affecting the minerals in the animals and in our bodies. So, well, I mean, let's just use some basic logic. We don't have to stand in line and wait for somebody to do a 10 year, you know, thousand person study. Just use your brain. Use, use the brain God gave you. You know, that's what I tell people. And if you're not feeling good and we have this information, let's start decreasing things. Let's just find the holes in the roof. You know, it's sort of like um, if you saw evidence of um, termites in your house and you called the exterminator and he said, oh, I'm not sure that's termites. Let's just wait till that wall falls down. I mean, that's what happens to people every day in so many areas. So, so this is, this is incredible information. Absolutely incredible. Uh, I think if people, you know, can do just start somewhere with one thing, Martha, I mean, glyphosate, you've, you've taught me so much about glyphosate today. And then, um, the mannitol actually helps clear the glyphosate too, correct? Well, no, it's actually not the mannitol. So we, we have a strain of bacteria in the formula, um, our lactobacillus plantarum tbc 36 okay. this was a strain of bacteria so a lot of the lactobacillus are uh, susceptible and killed by glyphosate but um we had a strain that was um resistant to it and so was our leuconostoc so both of those it was interesting the leuconostoc came from cabbage that I had grown in my, so I made sauerkraut in my garden, like seven years before I started my company. And I, so I had this old sauerkraut and we isolated strains of bacteria from it. And oh then God. the lactobacillus plantarum came, um, a young woman in my lab and I just went out in the wild collecting, you know, fruits and different things in Colorado to ferment. And we fermented all these things. And, um, from the elderberries that I collected in my neighborhood. Um, and of course, lots of people are using glyphosate. Um, it had a lactobacillus plantarum that was resistant to glyphosate and had something called the third pathway. Because one of the one of the problems you have is, you know, lots bacteria can break the glyphosate down, but they break it down into another substrate that is called AMPA. And AMPA is more toxic than glyphosate. So you need a bacteria that can break it all the way down, you know, to CO2, I think it's CO2, phosphate, and water. And um, our uh, strain of bacteria had this third pathway that enabled it to do that. And this, uh, and so, you know, we started looking at that as kind of a, a superstar because, you know, possibly it's helping um, remove the glyphosate from the, the body, or if you're eating something with glyphosate in it, it can, you know, be beneficial in that. So I've actually was talking to, um, one of the pioneers in raising the red flag about glyphosate last week and talking to him about how we could do some testing of, uh, you know, people who either already know they have a high glyphosate load or they're exposed to more, glyphosate um there is a lab called hri labs that tests for um glyphosate and uh john fagan is uh one of the founders of that laboratory and 
uh, what they were telling me was that John had done, he was doing all these time series samples of his own glyphosate load. And he went out to this Italian restaurant and had uh, pasta one night and his, the next day, his glyphosate went off the chart. So, you know, one day you can go out and that's one of the, I mean, I love to eat out at a nice restaurant, but you have no idea where that food is right. coming from. <laughs> no. You don't. And um, just to be aware that it could be impacting your health so dramatically, so quickly is just such incredible information. It, it's just really news everybody can use. I mean, no matter right. what. Um, the other I, thing is on the food side, there are now 60 different crops that use glyphosate as a desiccating agent. Right. So let's say at the end of the harvest, so they get mm -hmm. an even dry and they mm -hmm. can time everything like, and wheat is one of those. Mm -hmm. So, and if you think about it, spraying it on at the end of the harvest, there's going to be a lot more left mm -hmm. there as a residue. So, you know, it's things like lentils and chickpeas and stuff that you, you're thinking, oh, that's healthy. Right. <laughs> Maybe not. Right. No. And, and, you know, as a clinician, I've just seen people get sicker and sicker at younger ages. When I first got out of dental school in 85, um, the average 60, say my age, 64 year old was taking maybe one medication, maybe two at the most, but nobody was really diabetic. Uh, I wasn't seeing even gum disease in people under 30 or 40. And now that's totally changed because of all, you know, this change in environment, this uh, change in the soil of our lives. You know, all these things you've talked about are really the soil of our lives. Um, so interesting. Um, I want, I want the listeners to hear your story. I, I, um, I don't mean to throw this on you about you climbing Kilimanjaro. Well, that, you know, I was really, really blessed. Um, so John, uh, was very involved in a program called Pedaling for Parkinson's, where a researcher from the Cleveland Clinic um, had shown that um, cycling for a certain period of time, but for an hour, four times a week, or three or four times a week at a certain cadence, you could lower your Parkinson's symptoms by 35%. And so he had gotten connected to some other doctors and people who were working on, and they were actually working with this woman named Lori Schneider, who has multiple sclerosis. And she also has uh, chronic lymphocytic le leukemia. So I should introduce you to her. Wow. Um, and uh, she had climbed the seven summits, the tallest mountain on each continent after being diagnosed with Parkinson's. And so she was organizing this trip. Um, or MS, was it MS? Was she? Yeah, she, with MS. MS. And, and it was mostly people. So she was putting together, it ended up being 28 people, uh, 14 uh, with either Parkinson's or MS. So there were uh, 10 with MS and, and uh, four with Parkinson's. And then each person was pa paired with a healthy climbing partner. So, you know, John got invited and he invited me. And I, I was, um, you know, had been... I, I'm a workaholic, as I'm sure you can probably tell from, <laughs> but, um, I hadn't been exercising that much. And so, you know, we started, uh, training and that was actually one of the best times in our marriage, just because we would have to go on these long hikes and we would go for, you know, seven, eight, 10 hours a day on the weekends hiking. And then every evening we're walking around the neighborhood. So that was really great. But we, we, um, you know, we got to Africa with our group and, you know, we're trekking along. And of course you think, you think you're on that. Everybody's on the same trip you're on. <laughs> One of my, right. One of my biggest learnings after Key that, point. Trip, nobody's on the same trip you are <laughs> not up that mountain, not in this life. Nobody is on That's the right. same trip. <laughs> Great point, Martha. Thank you. Great point. And, uh, it really, it changed my perspective so much about so many things in, in life. Um, of our 28 people, um, 21 made it to the top and, uh, of the seven people who didn't make it, I think four or five of them were actually the healthy climbers. Um, 
So, you know, we just saw incredible uh, tenacity and, you know, spirit and what it could do for people. But for me, it was actually a a deeply spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you read, we have a book called More Than a Mountain, Our Leap of Faith, where each uh, person on the trip wrote a chapter and I wrote a chapter called Finding My Way. But, you know, we got to about, I'll see if I can tell this without crying. It's okay to cry. <laughs> this is a safe place to cry. We we got to about 16,000 feet and it's um, 19,400 some feet. And we had been divided into three groups and John and I were actually in the fastest group because, we, you know, we lived at altitude, we trained more and nobody wanted to be in the fast group. So it was like us and one other uh, person from the trip, Sarah, uh, who was a much younger person with MS and then the photographer who uh, was in, in our group. So, and our guides. And so like, you know, we're slogging along and I, I hit 16,000 feet and I'm thinking, I don't, I don't know if I can make, you know, it's so hard to breathe. It's so hard to pick your feet up. And um, I'm thinking in my head, well, if I quit, John will, probably not go on he'll go back with me so I I cannot quit he's got to get to the top of this mountain <laughs> and I'm gonna cry with you as I know the story it's incredible you know, my, my mother had um my mother had lymphoma MS thyroid cancer and breast cancer and you know she was an incredible person of faith and I I'm I've never been what I would say is like a conventional like go to church every Sunday kind of person but I'm deeply deeply spiritual and my mother one of you know I had her Norman Vincent Peale books and um you know one of the things she would always have written places is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and so you know I'm that starts coming into my head and, you know, I, like people talk to you about meditating and how you get into this Zen state. Well, you know, it's very hard for me to sit still in a chair and get in a Zen state, but I'm walking up this mountain and I start, that's my mantra. I can do all things through Christ. <laughs> and both of my parents had passed away by then. And they came to either side of me and carried me up the mountain. And I like, it was as real to me as, you know, them standing in front of me. And, you know, I, I fully believe that, you know, they, they carried me up the mountain and um, then I got to the top and I, we were like, well, how quick can we turn around and get back down? But, uh, you know, it was incredible. And, uh, you know, that they photographed John and I at the top of the, I mean, the one thing we, we sort of missed out of it is the bigger group that all ended up getting up there together after us, we passed them as we were going down. And so, you know, there was a big picture of all of them together and there's, you know, John and I are, are there by ourselves. Oh no, that was a very intimate moment. And I appreciate you sharing such an intimate story. Um, I think it's so good for all of us to hear because, um, I have, I have a faith, but you know, I went through a crisis years ago when, um, I, and many people have been maybe disappointed by Christians, um, maybe harshly judged and, uh, it, it can really impact the future. And so I think your story is just so beautiful that, you know, it was, it was you and God and, exactly. and that's what it comes down to. So often we look at, you know, church people or whatever for, um, the truth of our faith, but the truth of our faith is actually only with Christ. And I, I just love your story. And, um, it's just so profoundly, um, raw and, um, and you mentioned before that you had been sort of hurt by the church and, you know, I've, I felt that along with you. Cause I have two, um, 
from a, uh, a, a young divorce in my life. And mm-hmm. so, um, I appreciate you sharing that Martha, because you are just one of the smartest people I've ever met. I mean, to go from being an auditor, which is a really hard job for someone who, when my checkbook would get out of whack, I just go change bank accounts. And so, um, <laughs> you know, so I admire anybody who can make it all add up. Um, but, but then to make this transition out of trying to find a way to save John and you have it as you all get to know Martha more going to Martha's quest and, um, and just looking into the amazing science she's done, you'll, you'll learn that she never gives up. She keeps looking and she, um, she leaves no stone unturned. I mean, just the story about being out in your garden, good grief. I didn't know about that. That's, that's amazing. So how can our listeners find you? I would, and and it's just on a personal note, uh, I use these, um, these probiotics, I use sugar shift and I can't wait to get the, their revive, Revive, you know, um, formulation. And so it's going to help so many of my patients. I just can't wait. I mean, there's so many people needing this. Um, so you know, what, uh, oh, she has a TED talk. She has a TED talk. You've got to watch her TED talk. It, um, it's fantastic. So how can I get a hold of you? So you can, you can find, you can find the probiotics. It's, it's kind of a mouthful. It's, um, biotic quest. Like I think, uh, biotic, which is mm-hmm. life, life quest, but it's B I O T I Q U E S T.com. Um, my Parkinson's blog uh, that I write a lot about the Parkinson's and the microbiome, but also alternative health and diet and Qigong Mm -hmm. and things like that is Mm -hmm. marthasquest.com. And then if you want to know about the the geeky poop poop collection and all of that, um, it's uh, it's the website is the T H E bio B I O collective c-o-l-l-e-c-t-i-v-e dot com um you can also if you know if you've got a question or you know you can uh, email me at martha.carlin at the biocollective.com or i think i have martha at martha's quest.com wow you must never sleep martha <laughs> Well, with all you're accomplishing, more, like, you know, uh, I, I do feel sometimes I, John get, he gets, I mean, he knows I'm on a mission to, to find answers for him, but I, my daughter periodically says, now, mom, you need to put down your books and quit studying for a little while and pay some attention to dad. Oh, that's funny. That is so funny. Oh gosh. Yeah. You got to have time to have fun. Um, but I bet you do. I bet you have a lot of fun. It's just been fun getting to talk to you, Martha. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to, I'll put all those links in the show notes uh, for the listeners. And um, you've just inspired me and I know you've inspired everybody else. Thank you for your enthusiasm and your curiosity and your tenacity and your, you know, just the contagious nature of, of searching for answers that, that we can do on our own. Um, You know, as, as here at Vitality Made Simple, we say vitality doesn't need to be uh, complicated, confusing, expensive, or no fun. It's all about relationships, and you've really shown us that today. So so thank you for that. Uh, please keep sharing this podcast. If there's even one person who can be helped by Martha's story, uh, share it with them. And um, I, I thank you for listening. I thank you for sharing. You know, I'm a, a very much a social media introvert and uh, really a social media loser. So when it comes down to what so many people are doing, but nevertheless, the po- this podcast is now in 77 countries and it's because of our listeners. It's, it's not anything about me and I appreciate it so much and blessings until next time. 